Welcome to APA's weekly webinar. My name is Billy Zydek, Manager of Special Projects for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to APA's webpage later this afternoon. You will receive a follow-up follow email in the next couple of days with a link to the webpage where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through December 2021 and many are open for registration. Professional Continuing Education and AIA CLU credits are being offered for today's program. If you are an AIA professional requiring a certificate, please send an email to me at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at ava.org, along with your AIA membership number if you have not done so in the past. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your question in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by one of our presenters. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to John Downey, who will introduce the presenters. John, take it away. Thank you, Billy, and thank you, APA, for inviting Siri to share the the expertise of two of our Science Advisory Council members in this two-part webinar. As Billy mentioned, I'm John Downey, the Executive Director of Siri. My marching orders from the presenters is to keep their introductions brief in order to give them more time to do the actual presentations, and I can do that. So our first presentation is titled how to validate strategy, strategies that reduce the spread of COVID-19. Our presenter is Dr. Richard Shaughnessy, a world-renowned expert in indoor air quality. Richard is the director of the Indoor Air Quality Research Program at the University of Tulsa. Richard, it's in your hands now. Thank you, John. And uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, I've got my slides up now and I hope you can see them. Uh, what I'm going to talk about are caveats of and validation of control approaches. Um, and uh, 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 Karen, uh, Dr. Dan Miller will follow my presentation and talk more in depth related to the presence of the virus in um, facilities in terms of what we currently know. All right, I, you know, I've, I've been working in schools for over 30 years, and um, with all the problems that uh, I've faced related to challenges in helping districts uh, and uh, uh, educational facilities around the country, COVID-19 is is one that it's a new challenge to address in the edu in the in uh, our building stock related to schools and uh, facilities. And, you know, if ever there were a time that, you know, one straw, you're breaking the camel's back, I feel that this is the one. Uh, the system was always fragile uh, in terms of being able to address uh, uh, air quality issues in indoor environments and schools. And this uh, left many school districts unprepared to be able to address it. I can tell you from my own perspective that never, I mean, never in our current history as I know it, uh, has it been so critical to optimize indoor air quality to the best of our ability. And when I say that, it's not just one approach, it's a holistic approach of source control, cleaning, ventilation, and air cleaning has to be engaged. I'm sure you've seen this by now, so I'm not going to go into it, other than I will be talking about different aspects of it. But of course, there is the concern over close contact surface, uh, air transmission, and resuspension is one as well that uh, we suspect to be a significant problem, and Dr. Dan Miller, uh, Karen will talk about that later. So the topics I'm going to address address here are hygiene, uh, cleaning, disinfection, why, what we know, what we don't, uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, as a metric to validate, and how do we interpret some of that? 
on ventilation, I'm going to talk about optimization and validation of ventilation. And on air cleaning, really when it comes down to what's tried and true has worked in the past and it can work now too as a supplemental approach. Also make a few comments on the post-pandemic new world that we'll be facing for years, years to come and going forward. Um, sources of contamination within, with uh, COVID-19, everything around, every any carrier of the virus, that's uh, uh, anything near to touch worn by an infected person, including all high touch objects and surfaces. I mean, we shed somewhere greater than 40,000 dead skin kills every day. Um, uh, on the hour, it's a phenomenal uh, amount of shedding that we have as well. And then there are dust and resuspension issues with respect to that as well. Um, whereas the, uh, the idea of cleaning and uh, disinfection is one of the approaches, control approaches. Um, you know, it, uh, we seem to have very guidance from the CDC. And uh, they, they kind of uh, lowered the tier with respect to cleaning and uh, disinfection being so important. However, even in the past, even in the past week, uh, two weeks, we have a paper that's published and it's right there on the CDC website, uh, the risk for fomite mediated transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and in schools, uh, nursing homes. So when we're talking about high density occupant scenarios, this is something very important to consider. And as you can see, they found that fomites and uh, uh, might be a substantial source of transmission risk, particularly in these high occupant type scenarios in schools and daycares and what. Uh, direct physical contact, I, I'll start, you know, I mean, we touch things, we put it to our hands, then we put it to other people and uh, we just carry it and then, uh, and um, it, it's not something that dissipates quickly on our hands. Uh, if you look at a, a virus, uh, a common coronavirus uh, associated with the common cold, uh, we see that the the uh, the virus itself can remain detectable on the hands of an adult after after some 60 minutes of drying. So 43% of the virus survival spill at that point in time. So uh, they, they're in, you know, hand washing. I mean, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is basic. You know, it's not rocket science, but it's things that we have to pay attention to. We've heard before, and there's there's a lot of reason for that. Cleaning as a whole, uh, Mike Berry, the former uh, US EPA director of National Center for Environmental Assessment at RTP in North Carolina, uh, he, he's kind of like a pioneer in cleaning. Many years ago, he kind of led the charge on cleaning and health. But he, he stated time and time again, cleaning is the process of removing removing unwanted soils and microorganisms. When a surface gets uh, touched, I can tell you it does get contaminated. We do leave a fingerprint there. And the essential elements of cleaning are, are, are if we're cleaning the surface, if we're wetting it, what is the dwell time? How long is that cleaning agent uh, disinfectant uh, in contact with the surface. That's very important to the removal. Simply spraying onto a towel and then wiping the surface, you're negating that dwell time. Uh, the displacement pressure of wipes, uh, very important, I can tell you. The removal itself is obviously what we're trying to achieve. And then validation of that is very important. You say, okay, and wiping the surface clean, how difficult could it be? I mean, really, all we're doing is wiping. Well, that's not quite the case. If we look at um, some of these, uh, we look at what we have when uh, we don't uh, have a, a consistent wiping approach, what we're doing is smearing. 
when we when we try to claim in a circular motion, I was at a very large uh, facility taking thousands of measurements a few weeks ago. We're just wrapping it up, but what we saw is people doing the the uh, round and round with the uh, with the clock, just going in circular motion. Uh, one one gentleman uh, that was working with us uh, called it the Mr. Miyagi technique. If you've ever seen the Karate Kid, going round and round and round, and all you're doing is smearing the dirt with that. Um, the aseptic principle on wipes and usage is that look to one wipe and make sure that you're using only one surface of the wipe, uh, and and and. Uh, that surface is not already contaminated by another uh, being used elsewhere. Use only in one direction and apply firm pressure. And and again, use on only one surface and and apply it directly directly to um, to the surface itself. It, 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 to validate is so important. And, and, and I'd, I'd say until the past 15, 20 years, you know, it was difficult to validate, you know, the white glove test. That's not a good way to validate whether or not we're in good shape or not. Uh, fundamental to cleaning is, has there been an attempt to clean? Has the cleaning process lowered the degree of contamination? And you've got to have a valid metric. You have to have something to use, okay? There are imperfections with respect to all the metrics out there, uh, but we have to have a start point and an end point to understand where we're um, uh, where we're going with that. And uh, have you achieved uh, the cleaning that is intended? And there are many different types of metrics that can be used, and these are all listed here. And I don't have time to go into them, but I am going to talk about adenosine triphosphate testing. Uh, ATP testing, um, which is simple and it's easy to use. ATP is a marker for the presence of biomass. Uh, it's been used for years as an estimation of uh, contaminant load in hospitals, food industries, and uh, more recent high occupant, uh, high density occupant uh, areas, schools, uh, commercial facilities. Uh, uh, even aircraft and airlines uh, as well. Uh, the, there are many different types of monitors on the market, so it's kind of like a take your pick with respect to them. But keep in mind, they all report different outputs, so, and that output, again, is related to the degree of contamination uh, on the surface without going into the ATP technology itself. I can tell you there's a reaction that occurs that causes a light um, to, to occur, kind of like fireflies, actually. And the intensity of the light is related to the degree of contamination. And for me, I mean, I look at ATP, it's a love-hate relationship. It's rapid, it's portable, it's affordable. It provides a metric for cleaning effectiveness. So hey, why not? You know, this is a this is a useful tool to use, and you get you get an immediate readout for the most part. But if you look at the downside, and it's important to recognize these so that you understand the value of your data at the end of the day. It's dependent. Uh, uh, the outcomes are dependent on surface irregularities, on the type of surface. There is variance based on the swab sampling method. Uh, devices, all the devices I just showed you, they have varied output ranges reflecting biocontamination loads. Uh, so one meter is not going to give you the same reading, and you have to have uh, some inter-correlation uh, between one meter's output and another. So standard curves need to be developed for these things to be able to interpret. Uh, Uneven soil distribution on surfaces, that becomes a problem. And replicates need to be obtained to get representative numbers. Greg Whiteley, uh, a peer from, um, uh, researcher from Sydney, Australia, 
has written some wonderful papers on algorithms to uh, to undertake to get representative data. And essentially what he's talking about is how many samples do you need to take? And we've done the same with respect to our research to get representative numbers. But one, one reading isn't going to tell you as a whole what the facility is doing. Now, I, I just want to show you something here. Say you're taking ATP data in the field. Some of you may have, some of you may have not. These are the areas that I'm looking at. And these are the square centimeters that we're, the, that we're sampling from. And this, the pre and post means before cleaning, and the post means after cleaning. Again, pre-cleaning, post-cleaning. Look at these numbers. Pre and post, please. Pre-cleaning, post-cleaning. Now, Clearly, you can't talk back to me here, and that's unfortunate. But what I would ask you is, what do you see here? And what we see here is that the pre-cleaning numbers, in many cases, are lower than the post-cleaning numbers. Again, uh, or you have only a marginal decrease in the ATP values. Uh, here again, you have an increase from 1,000 to 1,504 relative light units. This has to do with the clean trace monitor. Uh, or you see very small um, uh, um, drops related to uh, pre and post cleaning. With effective cleaning, you should get upwards 80, 70, 80, 90 percent reduction in the contaminant load. And we're clearly not doing this. So what we instituted here were some cleaning modifications so as not to do it circular, not to uh, apply it to the cloth to have the proper dwell time and look at the same surfaces now with respect to after implementing cleaning modifications. You see pre and post all the way down the line and these are the kinds of outcomes that you would expect with effective cleaning and we were taking viral as well. I just can't get into all of what we're looking at right now um, as a whole. But I did want to give you an example of what what you have when you have poor cleaning. And and you need to recognize that right away. Just, uh, you know, I always uh, told my students in the field techs that we had over 100 field techs working all throughout a space in the past month. And, and I said, it's not just don't write the numbers down. You know, look at what you're getting. What is the data telling you? And what this tells me is something is dramatically going wrong in your cleaning process. And it's got to be a fix somewhere. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. We've taken thousands and thousands and thousands of measurements. We've taken them in school districts. Uh, we published on that back in 2013. We're able to give you a distribution of what might be typical that you'll see in a school facility. Um, the ISSA has taken this and developed a standard related to schools of uh, what is effective cleaning, what is not, and they've, they've extended that to commercial facilities as well. Uh, and, and again, you see a typical distribution of what 50 percentile might be and on the high end and then the low end here is what we're looking at. Um, we've also taken a lot of data related to student health, not just absenteeism, uh, but we have seen uh, correlations found with gastrointestinal related student absenteeism uh, where we knew, we knew why the student was absent from the call-ins uh, from the district and uh, ATP levels. And uh, so this is currently being published. It's submitted for publication. 17,000 students were involved in, uh, but you know, upshot of this, absence related to GI significantly increased as level of surface biocontamination increases. These are the kind of data that we're hoping to expand upon. And we're looking more at, we've got five years of health data on a, uh, on a, uh, uh, a large body of students. And we're looking at that with changes and 
things such as cleaning, ventilation, and other things as well. Uh, the case, again, goes back to, well, I mean, is cleaning important? And from our studies, I can tell you definitively cleaning is important. If we look at, a, a, a especially in high occupancy uh, situation like schools and daycares, if you look at what gets laid down on a desk, this is uh, work that we did with uh, Sarah Kwan, uh, Jordan Pecci at Yale University, and we published on this. Uh, but you see, you have an abundance of bacteria, fungi, uh, and these are human-born, human-born organisms for the most part, not environmental. Um, and we, it, it, this really shouldn't be a surprise to us because, you know, schools are today's Petri dish for contamination. I just, you know, I flat out believe that, and that's, that's the way it is. We've also looked, we've gathered information that we feel is very important in terms of trying to get to uh, if you have contamination, how long does it take to re-equilibrate on a surface? And we published on that as well uh, in the Journal of Applied Microbiology, um, and uh, that's out there as well. But that's important because we're trying to be effective at cleaning without overcleaning, and and and, and so we don't want to uh, overindulge, but we do want to have commensurate cleaning such that you don't get buildup uh, beyond. Uh, you know, at, at what point, how many days does it take? And we found about two days after two days, you re-equilibrate after cleaning on a desktop. Yet desktops often are not cleaned for upwards of a week, if at all, um, in facilities. So something to keep track of. And also ATP and microbes. We found very good correlations uh, between microbes and ATP. Uh, the bioluminescence, so the ATP measurements correlated well with uh, surface concentration analysis of bacteria, fungi, and human cell concentrations, and we published on this as well. Uh, we recently published on uh, looking at the occurrence of respiratory viruses on school desks. Uh, Karen uh, uh, will be going more into work that she's done as well. Uh, we're expanding this work in other facilities, but what we saw, um, uh, this was led by Jordan Pexia uh, with our team and our effort as a whole. What we found is that the probability of encountering at least res one respiratory virus uh, positive surface is uh, if you have a person based on sitting at one desk per day, you have someone in the order of only an 18% chance, 18, 19% chance of coming in contact with the virus related to the desktop. But if you have mobility within the students and you're sitting at five different desks per day and other people have traveled through those desks, we now see that the, the probability of encountering at least one respiratory virus positive surface is 65%. Again, a very important factor and something that needs to be taken more into account related to the importance of cleaning. Upshot of this, um, viruses are capricious residents in classrooms on high touch surfaces and desktops are exemplary fomites. I wanted to touch also on ventilation. Ventilation is very important as we know uh, to deal with the aerosol fraction. And ASHRAE, basically their guidance is increase outdoor air ventilation to 100% as indoor and outdoor conditions permit. Other, other uh, approaches of filtration, portable air cleaners, UVGI, uh, temperature relative humidity, relative humidity control are also in effect. But what does this mean for you in a classroom? It means that if you're trying to meet ASHRAE standard 62, depending upon the volume of the room and uh, the classrooms we're looking at are typically 850 square feet, a little bit larger than you might encounter. That means you need about two to three air changes per hour just to meet ASHRAE 62.1. Now, if you have a smaller classroom, 
it's more on the order of three to four air changes per hour to meet ASHRAE 62.1. Um, so, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but as well with that, how do we validate that? Well, one thing, carbon dioxide, I, wait, I don't have near enough time to go into it. I can only touch on it here, and I've only got a few minutes left, but carbon dioxide is a uh, decent, I call it decent surrogate for ventilation. It's a crude indicator of ventilation adequacy. Many assumptions must be met, but if you know the equilibrium or steady state level of carbon dioxide, that is, what is the highest level that is achieved in the classroom, and assuming that is steady state, you can calculate, you can calculate what the ventilation rate is per person from this example. And here's, here, here's an example from that equation. Here's an example where, say you have 25 kids, 850 square feet, CO2 outdoors is 410. This is the generation rate per person. And this is your, uh, what you're trying to achieve for 850 square feet. Uh, per person, according to ASHRAE 62.1, um, it, it would tell you that you want to stay not to exceed around 900 parts per million uh, if meeting outdoor air per ASHRAE 62.1. If, if you're trying to go, say, 30% above that, the not to exceed now gets down in the 700s. So these are important guidelines. You know, the old 1,000 part per million rule of thumb doesn't work so well in schools. And we want to do better than that. And so trying to achieve levels less than 900 and ultimately, if you're really uh, exceeding ASHRAE guidelines in the 700 range is something better to shoot for. And we do know this. Many schools are underventilated or inappropriately ventilated. Ventilation is fundamental, fundamental, um, uh, uh, COVID or not, pre-COVID, we understood that to be the case as well. But we've done a lot of research that shows just how poorly ventilated school classrooms are. Um, with filtration, MERV 13, it just breeze through this. Uh, that's what we're trying to put in as the system can, can, um, uh, can operate be functionally, um, so it has to be compatible with the system. And remember, filters are only effective when the system is running, and an average runtime in homes is less than 20 percent. You know, in buildings, we've got to be sure that the system is running if if we're going to get any impact of filters. So, in other words, air must constantly be moving through the system. Uh, portable air cleaners, we've done a lot of studies for over 30 years on these. And uh, I can tell you in a heartbeat, uh, HEPA-based portable air cleaners, if you're using one, that's tried and true. Uh, this is what I'd shoot for. There are uh, metrics such as clean air delivery rate. We wrote a paper on that back in 2006, which is one, what is an effective portable air cleaner? Uh, but AHAM, the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturer, gives you a label on these uh, air cleaners you buy to tell you what the CADR is, but even more important, what is the square footage that that air cleaner is appropriate for? In a classroom, you may need more than one air cleaner to, to get the degree of reduction that you're trying to strive for, but any reduction is good reduction. Ventilation, air cleaning summary, increased ventilation, reduced recirculation, filtration, uh, higher efficiencies, UV and air cleaners, supplementary. Watch out for ozone generating devices. There are no overnight fixes. If it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. And last, the Swiss cheese respiratory, this is the thing that no single intervention is perfect. You, you could start with some of the important ones such as masks, and if masks, you're going to avoid, you know, contact, and, and then you're going to look to ventilation, and then you're going to look to quarantine and vaccines, you know, 
these are all down the line, but it's a, it's a holistic approach that you have to undertake. And Rich Corsi developed a risk estimator of layered approaches to dealing with COVID. And if you go to safeairspaces.com, you'll see that. And in closing, I'd like to say, you know, for the future, well, what have we seen in the past season? Flu cases have declined dramatically. And uh, the measurements in place to reduce COVID have helped keep the flu down. And what I'm talking about here, CDC estimates that somewhere between 9 and 45 million illnesses, up to 100, 810 hospitalizations, and 61,000 deaths uh, annually occur since 2010. In 2021, there have been only 1,766 clinical lab-reported cases to the positive cases to the CDC. We've got a green map that we're looking at, and so everything we're doing to slow the transmission of COVID should also reduce the transmission of flu, which means for the future, social distancing, hygiene habits, online learning, that's still going to be there. You know, this might be your new back-to-school clothes, virtual settings, and as such. Cleaning hygiene is important. Validate. Ventilation is important. Maximize the outdoor air within reason uh, that the system can deal with. Air cleaning, tried and true. Use a holistic approach and make sure it's sustainable for the future. Um, this is what we're in for, for for decades and for the futures I see it going forward. Uh, these are other uh, our investigators who I no way could I do the work that we're doing now without all of these individuals and acknowledging that. So with that, I wanted to close. Um, we are doing a Healthy Buildings Conference in 2021. That's the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, hosted by the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, and it will be bridging the gap between research and practice. I hope you attend. With that, I'm going to knock off and hand it over. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. As always, excellent. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move forward now right away. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Karen Dannemiller. Uh, she will give our second presentation, virus, I'm sorry, viral transmission in the indoor environment and the impact of cleaning. Karen is an assistant professor at The Ohio State University, where, among other responsibilities, she directs the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group. Dr. Dan Meller, please take it away. Thank you so much for the great introduction and for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here and share some of our current work with you. Uh, so, uh, as John Downey said, I am an assistant professor at Ohio State University and I direct the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group. So we're really interested in studying microbes in the indoor environment. Right now, we're looking to the future. And so uh, we see the virus cases going down, the vaccines are being rolled out. But unfortunately, COVID-19 is unlikely to be eradicated in the near future. And so the what I'm going to outline today is a technique we're looking towards uh, as a long-term monitoring strategy in high-risk areas and buildings where we might need to pay attention, uh, such as schools. This is going to be especially important for variants that might evade immunity in the future or individuals who might not have immunity for uh, some specific reason. And so in the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group, uh, we're really looking at developing a new technique for building level monitoring. We have uh, wastewater monitoring, which has been fantastic at monitoring a very large population for a low sample number. And recently, we've also been using a lot of individual testing, which can give you really high resolution data, uh, but is time intensive and uh, very costly. We wanted to evaluate a new technique to look at building level monitoring. Uh, to see if we could do more monitoring at the building scale to target this. So in my presentation, I'm going to give a quick overview about how I think about viruses in the indoor environment, and then I'm going to highlight our recent study uh, on SARS-CoV-2 and dust, and finally end with some practical implications 
or schools. So very briefly, what is a virus? I think we're all very familiar with this at this point, but it's a infectious agent and it's basically genetic information inside a package. And understanding this fact is gonna be really important for understanding some of the later data I'm gonna show you, but it's basically this, this genetic information inside this package. There's a lot of viruses out there. Um, they do require other cells to replicate, such as human cells, other bacteria. And there's in fact an estimated uh, 300 or 320,000 mammalian viruses alone. Uh, so this is what the inside of a virus might look like. You have your nu nucleic acid in the middle, either DNA or RNA, depending on the virus, uh, a capsid surrounding that, and then an envelope on some viruses uh, might have glycoprotein spikes, such as the coronavirus. When I think of virus, viruses in the indoor environment, I like to think about particle size. Um, and they are, in fact, present in a wide range of particle sizes. You can see here a volatile organic compound. This is a chemical like, that you might smell, something like formaldehyde. Um, you can see the typical virus size is 0.12 microns in diameter, but they're usually not floating around alone. Usually they're in larger water droplets, such as this one micron droplet here that might be emitted from a person who's breathing, coughing, talking, sneezing, um, whatever they're doing. And these particles can have a really wide range in terms of their size distribution. Um, in fact, you can look at this beautiful picture of the sneeze here, where you can see there's smaller particles, there's larger particles, there's this really wide range of particles. And people have been talking a lot about aerosol transmission uh, of SARS-CoV-2, and that tends to happen in these really small particles, these one micron particles. But you also have these larger particles that are emitted, and they tend to sort of fall to the floor. Um, and so this is something we were thinking about potentially taking advantage of when looking for new surveillance tools to understand uh, prevalence of the disease in the built environment. When we think about actual virus transmission, it's really complicated. Um, you can have multiple transmission routes that are potentially important. You can have droplet transmission via close contact aerosol transmission, these uh, smaller particles over larger distances, or direct or indirect contact. Um, so for instance, transmission via surfaces. And it's really challenging for any virus to understand uh, what the predominant transmission routes might be because it's usually not a very straightforward picture. Um, I will say we have definitely learned a lot about coronavirus transmission um, over the course of this and the, particularly the importance of aerosol transmission, but that doesn't mean other routes aren't potentially important as well. So we wanted to ask the question, what about viruses and dust? We know from studying other microbes that dust serves as an important microbial reservoir. And we've found other viruses at high levels in floor dust. Uh, we've also seen potential of SARS-CoV-2 on particulate matter. So we wanted to see if dust might be important as a matrix to actually measure the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in a particular building or particular indoor environment. Um, and this is really moving towards developing a improved long-term long -term surveillance solution at the building scale. We have these great wastewater monitoring efforts. We can definitely do individual testing, but is there something we can do more long-term for individual buildings such as schools? Uh, so next I'm gonna highlight our recent study where we looked at SARS-CoV-2 in dust. So I mentioned wastewater monitoring. Um, you might have seen a lot of the great wastewater trackers out there. This one is the Yale COVID-19 wastewater tracker. And you can see um, at the top that the viral data in wastewater tracks really nicely with the case data at the bottom for each of these individual areas. Uh, so wastewater is great. It has a lot of benefits. You can measure an entire sewer shed, um, but it does also potentially have some downsides. Um, so the benefits of wastewater monitoring are you can monitor a large or small population. You can do an entire sewer shed. You can potentially do a building, but often sampling is difficult. You need to remove a 250 pound manhole cover to get down there. There are potential exposure concerns to collection of that sample. Um, wastewater can, is also very sensitive. It can detect one in about 100 to 2 million individuals. Um, but it does have difficult sample collection. The sample processing is challenging. You have to do a lot of pre-concentration steps and not everybody actually sheds the virus in feces. This is a respiratory virus after all. 
So for the study I wanted to highlight today, we wanted to evaluate dust as a matrix for outbreak surveillance. Uh, so for this, we collected samples from rooms of students who were in isolation, who had a positive test for COVID-19. And from these rooms, we compared bulk dust samples, surface swab samples, as well as a passive air sampler. Uh, these results are published in a study here. Um, I believe it might be uh, distributed as a handout after this presentation, or you can access it. It is open access online um, on the M Systems website if you do want to take a look. Uh, for this study, I wanted to mention that we measured viral RNA. So if you remember the picture I showed you earlier, the RNA is that material in the center of the virus. It's genetic material. Um, what this doesn't tell us is anything about the viral infectivity. It doesn't tell us if the virus is viable, if it's capable of infecting cells. You can have a destroyed envelope, so it's not no longer viable, but still intact RNA. Here, we didn't necessarily need to know if it was viable. We're more interested in surveillance, of finding out was someone who was infected in this building, um, and can we pick that up in the data? So what we found um, when we compared these three different techniques, the surface swabs, the passive sampler, and the floor dust, is that in terms of the viral concentration that we could pick up, we consistently got the highest levels from our floor dust samples. Um, so you can see here the darker colors in red, and we compared three different PCR techniques. You can see the average on the right. In the blue, we also compared the percent of positive detects. And once again, we found that the floor dust was the most consistently positive of all of our sample types. Uh, if you use droplet digital PCR, we found that 97% of the samples from these isolation rooms were positive compared to you know, using any of the techniques, about 55% of the surface swabs and 20 to 30% of our passive air sampler samples. So this indicated to us that floor dust was a pretty good matrix to use to potential monitor, uh, potentially monitor buildings for possible outbreaks. Um, in this study as well, if you can see in panel A, we also measured viral concentration over time. Um, and we actually found surprisingly that the RNA did not degrade um, in the vacuum bags over time. This is nice because it means these samples are also stable, so you don't have to worry about cold chipping them. Once it's in the vacuum bag, it is pretty stable. Um, I should note that the actual persistence of this in the environment might differ because the environment within a vacuum bag is very different than being in a school where dust is being removed by vacuuming all the time. Um, but once in the bag, it is very stable. Uh, we did see some um, heterogeneity in the sample measurements as indicated in panels B, C, and D. Um, and this is likely because we weren't able to homogenize the dust in this study due to potential biosafety concerns. Um, but that's something that you can address. Um, you may just need to sample each bag maybe about three times, or we can uh, potentially look towards developing better homogenization techniques in the future. I should note that we were actually able to detect this viral RNA even after application of a disinfectant. Uh, so when we received these samples, uh, we just took the samples that they were already collecting in the isolation rooms via regular vacuuming. Um, before they would vacuum, they would apply this disinfectant, which is sort of a non-selective oxidizer. So it basically attacks anything. Um, and what we think is it's probably attacking the outer envelope of the virus and inactivating it, but actually leaves that RNA intact so we can still pick it up. Um, so we were pretty surprised by this. So people often ask me, you found viruses in the dust. What does that mean about viability? Um, essentially nothing. I wanna emphasize again, just to be completely clear, we did not measure viability in this study at all. We did not measure infectivity. We just measured the presence of that RNA in the center of the virus to see if we could pick it up as a potential surveillance technique um, analogous to wastewater so that you could see if uh, the virus had potentially been present in a building. Uh, so overall for the dust surveillance, it might be an easy and useful matrix to survey buildings uh, such as schools. It can complement ongoing wastewater monitoring efforts. Um, conveniently, the RNA was stable in the dust over time, so we didn't have to have cold storage, but we did not measure viability. 
and the dust uh, was not homogeneous. Uh, so we do need to think about that in terms of future sampling uh, for monitoring. So I wanted to talk about some of the practical implications of this work. Um, so what should we do now? What we're really interested in is uh, further developing this technique such that we could potentially monitor schools in the fall, especially as children go back to school. Many of them might not be able to be vaccinated yet. Um, and we'd love to keep an eye on what's going on in an individual building so that we know what the prevalence rate is in that building and if we need to take additional actions. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to mention is can I get my dust tested? Um, there are actually two companies right now who are uh, offering dust testing. I'm not affiliated with either of these companies, um, but you can contact them if you are interested in um, having the dust from your facility tested to keep an eye on this. I should note that an individual dust sample is probably not really helpful. You're going to need to be looking at trends over time. Um, so you're going to probably want to think about submitting multiple samples, figuring out what this means for an individual uh, school level. The other thing I wanted to mention to this group is we are also looking to build this out further and provide more information about what any of these measurements might mean. Um, so we're looking for uh, schools to participate in our pilot study. Uh, what this would involve is mailing in weekly vacuum bag samples, um, ideally for at least the rest of the year, but potentially over the summer too. We'll pay the postage for you. Um, we need the schools to have at least 100 people, um, ideally more, a larger, larger number of people in the building on a weekly basis. Um, and we're hoping to partner with schools who have a public-facing COVID-19 dashboard where we can look at uh, case data, but we do not want to collect any identifiable data, um, please. I did want to note we would be really excited if you can participate in our pilot study. We are planning to publish the, result, the results in aggregate. We are not interested in identifying your school specifically, um, but unfortunately we will not be able to share your specific data back to you at this time due to resource limitations, um, but your participation would help us move closer to hopefully building out a better uh, technique to monitor for COVID-19 in buildings, hopefully by the fall. Uh, please email me. My email is right here if you'd like more information about potentially participating. Um, and there will also be a handout sent out with my um, email information if this is something that you might be able to participate in. Uh, the last practical thing that I wanted to kind of end with is um, going back to the CDC hierarchy of controls. And when we're thinking about viruses in the built environment, um, it's important to prioritize what we can and can't do. And so this is a um, method often used in occupational settings to think about reducing hazards. Um, and the things that are the most effective and the most cost effective are at the top, uh, such as eliminating a hazard, and the least effective things are at the bottom. It's important to know that you can use um, multiple levels of this at the same time, but when we're thinking about schools, it's important to think about any hazards that we can eliminate. Um, this is not always possible and sometimes has downsides. So for instance, um, everybody remote learning is a way to eliminate that hazard, but it, there's obviously um, potential downsides to that as well. Um, engineering controls are things like ventilation in the middle, administrative controls are training, so keeping social distancing, things like that. And finally, um, PPE or things like masks, personal protective equipment are a critical part of the equation, but also potentially the least effective in terms of, um, of these different methods. So think about how they stack together, think about the ventilation in your schools, um, the other things you're doing uh, to help keep, uh, keep everything under control. I wanted to mention that I am uh, especially interested to hear the questions in this group, uh, what you think about this method, if it would potentially help you in the future, um, what you would need it to do uh, to help you hopefully maintain schools uh, op as operational in the fall. So please don't hesitate to reach out, ask questions here, um, and let me know. I'd love to love to hear your feedback. Uh, so in summary, we are working to uh, develop a new long-term surveillance solution at the building scale uh, using dust monitoring. Uh, so this will complement ongoing wastewater monitoring strategies at the sewer shed level, which can monitor even larger populations, um, but costs a little bit less compared to the individual level testing, which costs more, um, but gives you higher resolution data. 
this is a nice kind of intermediate resolution data set that you can potentially obtain to keep an eye on what's going on, um, especially as we move towards, towards the fall. So I have so many people to thank for this work, um, my awesome collaborators, my fantastic students. You can see um, us here in spring 2019, um, prior to COVID, um, all the co-authors, and uh, a lot of funding agencies that contributed to a lot of the techniques that were uh, used ultimately in development of, of the systems. And finally, the isolation room manager and coordinator and a carpet manufacturer who donated some uh, well-characterized samples uh, that were used. Uh, so with that, I would love to take your questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. I kind of I kind of jumped the uh, I, I jumped in a little bit early initially. I apologize for that. So uh, for the question and answer, uh, we're going to bring in our grand inquisitor, uh, Cliff Zlotnick. Uh, Z Cliff, Mr. Zlotnick has been busy in the background throughout the webinar reviewing questions for the Q&A. So Cliff, go ahead, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll start with a couple of questions for uh, Dr. Shaughnessy. I guess question number one is, what specific steps is the University of Tulsa taking to reduce COVID within facilities? Could you hear the question? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Within the University of Tulsa? Yes, sir. Uh, I, they're following the essential guidelines uh, that are, are out there right now in terms of they're maximizing uh, um, uh, outdoor areas the systems can handle. Uh, they do have an enhanced cleaning program in place. Um, they are not reaching MERV uh, 13 filters, to my knowledge, but uh, they are doing the best they can. Uh, they have options where you're either going virtual or you're face-to-face. -face. So many students are uh, picking the virtual track, which mm -hmm. leads to less people in the classroom. Uh, so we do have more distancing. And there are masks. Um, that are essentially required in the classrooms right now. Thank you. Okay, next question is for uh, Dr. Dana Miller. Uh, Karen, what are your thoughts on carpet and upholstery and other porous surfaces as COVID fomites? Thank you. That is a great question. I've spent a lot of time studying carpets and porous materials. Um, and in fact, we published an entire review article about what it means to have a carpet in an indoor space. You can look that up. It was um, on one of my slides in the journal Building and Environment. Um, and what we've determined is that carpets do act like a reservoir, which means that they're both a source and a sink. So any microbes that you have in the built environment are gonna to tend to be preferentially deposited into a porous surface, such as a carpet. Um, and then it also is a source. So as people walk over that, it does tend to get resuspended at um, what seems to be higher rates compared to solid surface flooring. Uh, so I do think though, in our study, I wanna emphasize again, that we did not measure viability of the virus in the dust. It is highly likely that the vast majority of the virus we measured was no longer intact enough to cause infection. Um, that is something we are actively studying now, so more results to be, you know, to be determined in the future. Um, but I did want to emphasize again, we were measuring just the RNA, so we really didn't learn anything about the infectivity of the virus in, in the dust. Um, so that is a uh, sort of an, uh, what I would say is an open question to be determined. My general sense of it is that it's probably not a huge source of transmission. Um, I think the aerosol route is really the dominant transmission route here from all the studies that have, have come out. Um, but I would also say it's actively being researched. So I don't have a solid answer for you um, right now. Oh, that was great, thank you. Dr. Shaughnessy, how much does an ASHRAE 62 fresh air ventilation rate reduce the effectiveness of modular air cleaners? Or aren't we cleaning a lot of air just to exhaust it?
Say that again, Cliff. <laughs> okay. Sorry. How much does an ASHRAE 62 fresh air ventilation rate reduce the effectiveness of modular or portable air cleaners? Aren't we cleaning a lot of air just to exhaust it? Well, I, I, I'm, I apologize if I don't quite get the gist of it, but I mean, there are two approaches. You could bring in dedicated outdoor air, or you can look to uh, lower the concentration related to what you have within the space with portable portable air cleaners. Um, I, you know, in, in tandem they can work very well. Um, uh, portable air cleaners, you know, typically what you're going to strive for is an 80% reduction. Uh, by industry standards in what you had prior to and post installation of the portable air cleaner. Um, that's a good reduction. Now, we may not always be needing that in classrooms, but uh, you do get upwards, you know, depending on what you do, uh, you're looking at, if you were at close to an 80% uh, reduction, you're, you're looking at an air cleaner that provides four to, four to five plus air changes per hour into the space. And what I went through earlier, if you're simply providing outdoor air or what, you're looking at and trying to meet ASHRAE's standard 62, you're looking at uh, between three to four air changes per hour that you're providing by that means. I'm not quite sure if that answered the question, but um, I, I hope that helps. Yeah, I think it did for sure. Okay, uh, Dr. Dana Miller, is the emptying of dust and vacuums for custodial workers then considered to be a hazard? That is a, a question we are considering. Um, I think it is something that we need to learn more information about before we can determine. Um, I would encourage people to be careful though, um, because we don't really know at this time. I will say it's unlikely the virus is gonna remain viable and just for a very long period of time. So one solution is just to wait. So um, even though we can detect the RNA for a long time, I would say based on other surface studies, it's unlikely the virus is gonna be viable for a long time. So you might wanna consider delaying to empty the bag. Maybe you vacuum one night and then you empty it the next day before you vacuum again. Um, that would be an easy solution to potentially reduce that. And then otherwise use just general common sense. They should be wearing masks you know, during COVID anyway. Um, I think that's a good option. Maybe make sure that they have some really good masks on um, and try to reduce that resuspension as much as possible, both for COVID and generally it's not great to you know, be inhaling large amounts of, of dust like that anyway. Um, but I think it, that is also a good, a good open question. I would encourage people to think carefully about what they're doing um, and consider some of those things. Okay, uh, and, and, and I'd just like to quickly add, you know, uh, what Karen just said is very important, not only with respect to dust, but taking a conservative precautionary approach is, is important. You know, absence of data uh, uh, is is not the absence of occurrence. And these data, uh, and Karen knows also well, and so do I, how difficult it is to get it in educational facilities. So we're gathering that information and that data, but um, uh, simply because we don't have all of the pieces at this point in time doesn't mean that it's not occurring. So what, what Karen just said is, is very important. Uh, take that precautionary approach and uh, we'll, we're learning more uh, daily as we go through this. Richard, that's great additional information. Uh, I need to hand things back to Billy because uh, we're about out of time. I just wanna thank our presenters today for this webinar and we have a few questions that we did not get to and I just want to remind everyone that the your question will be answered by one of our presenters in an email to you I want again thank you participants for taking the time to join us today 
Presenters, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate this information. And as always, be safe, stay healthy. Until next time, have a great day. Bye-bye now.